In this segment, we introduce terminology related to evaluating the energetics of chemical reactions. For this discussion, we're going to use as our example reaction type the free radical halogenation reactions that we've been focusing on for this chapter. The concepts that we're going to learn here are applicable not only to the free radical halogenation reaction types, but also to any additional reactions that we'll be looking at this semester. The terminology that we're going to develop here, such as looking at activation energies, transition states, rate limiting steps, and reaction coordinates, all of those key terms we will be able to apply toward other reactions later on. So we're laying the foundation here for using this terminology to discuss not only free radical halogenation reaction, but for analyzing chemical reactions much more broadly. So let's get started looking at reaction energetics and using as our example here the situation of free radical halogenation. So looking back at a general free radical halogenation reaction, which we talked about in an earlier segment, we're looking at the reaction up top here in red as our overall net reaction that is occurring here. We're taking an alkane molecule reacting it with chlorine in the presence of light and heat. And we're doing that monohalogenation reaction to install our chlorine atom at our most substituted carbon atom of the molecule. So the reaction mechanism, which we talked about in our earlier segment, first begins with initiation where we use a homolytic bond breakage to break the bond that connects the two chlorine atoms to give us two chlorine radicals as a result of that step then what happens is that chlorine radical comes in and it is very eager to react. So it's going to create the homolytic bond breakage of this carbon hydrogen bond right here from our alkane because breakage at that carbon hydrogen bond is going to lead to the most stable radical intermediate resulting from that, pro from that reaction step. So we're creating the most stable possible intermediate here by creating that tertiary carbon radical. Then we go on to the next so-called propagation step where that tertiary carbon radical is very eager to react and so it's going to come over use one of its electrons to force the breakage of this chlorine chlorine bond right here and that will enable the creation of a chlorine carbon bond by bringing one electron over from the chlorine one electron over from the radical carbon there to create that carbon chlorine bond that we see in our final product. So when we look at the energetics of this reaction, we're gonna focus on these propagation steps, the two propagation steps here, because of the fact that these propagation steps, as the name implies, are self-propagating. As we mentioned when we were going through the mechanism before, the product of the second propagation step, that chlorine radical, can re-enter the mechanism back here at the first propagation step. So therefore, this reaction pathway is self-sustaining. We can just cycle through until we are totally out of materials. And so looking at these two propagation steps is where we're going to focus our attention when we are defining terms related to the energetics of this reaction. So we're going to focus in on those two propagation steps there to look at the reaction energetics. So our focus here is going to be on the energetics of propagation. So our energetics of propagation. We're going to start by developing the reaction coordinate for this particular reaction. The reaction coordinate is a diagram that will show us the relationship between the energy and the progress of the reaction. So we're going to write out a reaction coordinate for this reaction. On our reaction coordinate for this propagation is going to have on the y-axis the energy and this will be true of any reaction coordinate that we draw is that the y-axis is going to show energy and the x-axis is going to show reaction progress in going from the starting material to the final product that's observed progressing from left to right and going from reactant to product. The other way that we can describe this 
x-coordinate is we can describe this as the reaction coordinate. So the reaction coordinate is what we define on the x-axis and that's what's showing the progress of the reaction. And we're going to be plotting the energy as we go along here. So as we look at the energetics of this propagation portion of the reaction, the reason we're focusing on this portion of the reaction and the energetics of that is because that's the self-sustaining portion of the reaction. So in the propagation steps, what we will do is in our reaction coordinate, we are going to be going through the two steps of propagation in the mechanism, the step here and the step here. So we're going to start our reaction coordinate by plotting the energy of the reactants for the first propagation step. So we're gonna be plotting the energy of the chlorine radical and our alkane. And I'm just gonna fill that in here somewhere along the y-axis. So what we're starting off here at is we're showing the energy of the reactants, the energy that is going into the first step. So that'll be the energy of the chlorine radical that we're starting with and the alkane reactant. And this is what's happening, or this is what's present at the beginning of the propagation step that we'll label step two of our reaction mechanism. So we'll call that step two and step three for the propagation steps. So we're looking at the energy of the chlorine radical and the alkane because those are the reactants that are going into that propagation step. Then what happens is in order for those reactants to become the intermediates that result from that step, the products of that step that I'm outlining in blue, what has to happen is an energy barrier will always have to be overcome. Even if the overall energetics of that particular reaction step are favorable, meaning we're going from high energy reactants to low energy products, there's always going to be an energy barrier that's involved in making and breaking the bonds. So we're gonna go ahead and draw in an energy barrier here. So our energy barrier is gonna be our spike or a mountain in this plot. And then I'm going to come back down from that energy maxima to a lower energy point here in the curve. So that top part of the curve is really relevant. We need to mention a couple of terms that go along with the top part, the peaks within an energy curve. And those peaks, such as the one we're seeing here, the mountain tops, if you will, are described as the transition states. So I'm going to put TS and I'm gonna define TS down here as our transition state. And you can think of the transition state as the status of the reaction where the bonds are in the formation, in the process of forming and breaking. So TS is our transition state. And that's really right at that point where the bonds that are being formed are in the process of being made. You could think of them as being half made or half broken at that point. So the transition state we're gonna define as bond making and breaking in progress. And that's why this is going to be the highest energy state is because of the fact that whenever we're joining those two atoms together or breaking them apart right as they're being made or broken is gonna be a really unstable point in the curve or in other words, a high energy point in the curve. So we can illustrate that for our propagation step two here in yellow by illustrating bonds that are half made and half broken. So for example, we're creating a new bond between H and Cl there. And so to illustrate this situation of where the transition state is going on, we can show a Cl for a chlorine. And rather than showing a completely made bond between the H and the Cl, we can show a dash there to indicate that that bond is in the process of being made. So that dash there indicates the bond is in the process of being made. The bond that's in the process of being made is the bond between H and Cl. So I'll go ahead and put an H in there to indicate that HCl bond is in the process of forming during this reaction step. During the reaction step, what is also happening is that we're in the process of breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond. So I'm gonna put a dash here to indicate that the bond to the carbon atom of the alkane is breaking. And I'm just gonna write C alkane here rather than drawing out the rest of that alkane molecule specifically. But those dashed lines there between Cl and H and between H and C indicate that those bonds are in the process of being made and being broken respectively.
So we're at the highest energy point here in the curve, also known as the transition state. Then after the transition state, that highest energy point, we come back down to a point where we level out here, and that point is going to represent the energy of our intermediate that forms as a result of that reaction step. So this is going to represent the energy of our intermediate that formed from that particular step of the mechanism. So that particular step of the mechanism yielded this carbon radical and HCl. So we can go ahead and draw in the energy of our carbon radical. So I'm just going to put C dot for our carbon radical and our HCl. And then from there, onward to the next step, what we call propagation step three, this next step of the mechanism, anytime we're making and breaking bonds, we're going to have a transition state occur. In other words, anytime we have a step of the mechanism, there's going to be a transition state occur. And so we need to bring the energy back up to reach that activation energy, and then we come down from there. So we have a second transition state that we can go ahead and unlabel. So I'm going to go ahead and put X's on both of those transition states and kind of label them as TS. And the TS that we're seeing here on the right, the second transition state, would represent the formation of that bond between the alkane radical and our chlorine atom. So I'm going to go ahead and schematically represent that by showing carbon that has a partially formed bond to chlorine because that carbon there that we're showing at the transition state is the carbon radical. And then that chlorine atom, the bond between the two chlorines in that propagation step two that I'm highlighting yellow there, the chlorine-chlorine bond is in the process of breaking. So we'll use a dashed line to reflect that that chlorine-chlorine bond is breaking there. So I'll do a dashed line there. And then from there, we go on down the energy curve to get to our final product of this reaction. So down here at the bottom, this would be the energy of our halo alkane product. In other words, our halogenated alkane. So our halo alkane product that forms as a result of that step of the mechanism. And also present there at that step is the chlorine radical. So we would include the energy of that in consideration there as well. So we're showing the full energy curve here to go from the starting material there at the beginning of propagation to the final monohalogenated product at the end of propagation. And you'll notice here that each of the steps of the mechanism that we have focused on has one relative energy maxima. So there's one transition state that corresponds to each step of the mechanism or each step of the mechanism that we're focusing on here. So the general rule as we start to write some things out here related to reaction energetics, and this will apply not only to free radical halogenation, but to any reaction we look at, is that when we look at a reaction coordinate and we're interpreting the information from that energy diagram, each step of the mechanism will have one transition state. So there's gonna be one transition state per step of the reaction mechanism. So if you're focusing on an entire reaction mechanism that has seven steps, then you would expect to see an energy curve that had seven transition states, seven peaks of the mountain along the pathway and going from the starting material to the final product. There will be one energy maxima for each step of the reaction because each mechanistic step of the reaction involves the making and breaking of bonds, and the making and breaking of bonds will always equate to an energy maxima. So there's gonna be one TS per step of the reaction mechanism. In other words, if you're looking at the reaction coordinate for an entire reaction mechanism, you can always count how many steps that mechanism must have based on how many energy maxima are there. Here we focus just on the two propagation steps, so that's why we're seeing only two peaks in the energy curve that we've looked at. The other thing that I want to point out to you in the reaction coordinate is the activation energies. Each step of the mechanism will have a so-called activation energy. That's the energy barrier required to go from the starting material of a step to the intermediate or product that forms as a result of that single step of the mechanism. So the EA, I'm going to read it as the activation energy or the energy of activation. And that's going to be defined as the energy barrier 
for each step of the reaction mechanism. So when we look at the energy barrier for each step of the mechanism, if we go back and look at our energy curve right here, and we want to take a look at the activation energies that are going on here. The activation energy is the difference in the energy between the starting material at a particular step. So here, our starting material at the first step is right here, because that's where the energy of our chlorine radical and alkane was as we started into propagation. So that's going to be the bottom of the energy. And then we take that up to the maximum energy of that particular step of the mechanism. So that's going to correspond to the transition state energy right up here at the top. And the difference between those two values will represent our activation energy for that particular step of the mechanism. So that's how much energy would have to be provided to the system in order for that step to take place. We come on over to the next step our additional propagation step here. The energy of that step is going to correspond to the energy we start with at the beginning of that step. So that's the energy of our carbon radical and HCl. And then we take and go all the way to the top of the energy curve there to the transition state that goes along with that step to give us the activation energy for that particular step of the mechanism. So we have two activation energies corresponding to the two steps of the reaction mechanism that we're focusing on here. And the step that has the largest activation energy will be the slowest step of the mechanism, or in other words, the bottleneck step, or it's commonly called the rate determining step or the rate limiting step. So whatever the step is here that has the highest activation energy is going to ultimately limit the overall rate of the reaction. So let's go ahead and fill in some more information then about the activation energy. It's the energy barrier for each step of the mechanism. And we can additionally add that the step with the largest activation energy will be the slowest step of the mechanism because it takes extra energy, extra time to overcome that barrier. So the step with the largest EA for activation energy must be the slowest step of the mechanism. And we can go ahead and add another term to go along with this. So you can think of that slow step as being the bottleneck step. And what this is going to do is this defines the rate limiting step or the rate determining step of the reaction. So this defines the rate limiting step, also known as the rate determining step. of the mechanism. And rate determining step is commonly abbreviated as RDS. You will sometimes see that written above a particular arrow in a mechanism step to indicate that that particular step is the slowest step of the mechanism. So if we look back at our reaction coordinate up here, and we want to pick out what the rate limiting step of the reaction is, we compare the activation energy for this propagation step to the activation energy of the next propagation step. And we notice that the activation energy for that propagation step on the left is definitely larger than the activation energy for the propagation step on the right. And so therefore, the rate limiting step or rate determining step of this propagation is going to be that first propagation there on the left. So I'm going to go in and to emphasize that in our mechanism here, in our propagation phase of the reaction, we can identify that this step is the RDS, the rate determining step. So what that tells us is that this is the step that's slowing down the whole pathway, much like a bottleneck. Nothing can get through an entire system any faster than it can get through that narrowest point of the passageway, the bottleneck. And this is our bottleneck here. It's going to be the step that has the greatest activation energy barrier, where activation energy is the energy from the beginning of that particular step, the starting materials that go into it, to the highest point on the energy curve for that particular step. So that's going to be our activation energy. And we can compare activation energies for the different steps to determine what the slowest step of the reaction mechanism is overall. And that's going to be what limits how fast we can form product out of any multi-step process where we have these multi-step mechanisms going on. So as we continue to look at general terms that we can use to describe reactions and to look at the energetics and 
of the reaction and how that relates to the progress of the reaction, we need to throw out a couple of additional terms that describe this reaction pathway overall. And those terms relate to the energy of the system as we compare the starting materials energy to the energy of the final product. So if we compare the energy that we begin with, that'll be the energy that we start with over here at the left, that energy of, in this case, the chlorine radical and the alkane, to the energy of the product that we're analyzing at the very end of this pathway, if the energy of the starting materials is greater than the energy of the products, we describe the reaction as being exothermic, meaning it's going to release energy or release heat during the course of the reaction. So that is the case for this particular halogenation reaction because if we look at the left here, where we see when we start, the energy here is greater than the energy that we finish up with. And so therefore we would describe this particular reaction as being exothermic. And so I'm gonna go ahead and write in a description here because certainly we're not always going to be talking about free radical halogenation reactions. So it's not really important to memorize the reaction coordinate as much as it is to be able to interpret a reaction coordinate. So don't try to memorize the exact curves that I've drawn in the reaction coordinate. Focus on understanding these terms and how to apply them toward reaction coordinates. So when we're talking about the overall reaction. We can describe the overall reaction as being exothermic. Exothermic meaning releasing heat, or in other words, energy. If the energy of the starting materials, in other words, the energy of the reactants, is greater than the energy of the products that form from that process. So we would describe the overall pathway up top of our free radical halogenation reaction as being an exothermic process because the energy that we start with on the far left is greater than the energy we finish up with in our final product that we create from that propagation. So on the other hand, a reaction can be described as endothermic anytime the energy of the reactants is less than the energy of the products. So in other words, if we were looking at the chart, we would see that our final product would have an energy that was greater than our starting material. We would describe that reaction as being endothermic, meaning that energy or heat is consumed during the course of the reaction. The other way to look at this is from the perspective of stability. Higher energy equates to lower stability. Lower energy amounts to higher stability. So when a reaction is exothermic, what that's telling us is that the products are more stable than the reactants. On the other hand, if a reaction is endothermic, that indicates that the products are less stable than the reactants. So endothermic if the energy of the reactants is greater than the energy of the products, or the other way to look at the stability of the reactants is less than the stability of the products. So let's now take this information that we've learned about reaction coordinates and apply it toward a problem to make sure that we've got all of this down. So we're gonna take a look at the problem below. And this is going to illustrate how we can apply the knowledge that we've learned up top related to free radical halogenation and apply it really generally toward evaluating reaction coordinates. So the question asks, based on the reaction coordinate that you see below, what is the rate determining step or RDS? How many steps are there in this particular mechanism that we're looking at, even though we know nothing about the reaction, just looking at the reaction coordinate, how many steps are in the mechanism? Can we classify the reaction as exothermic or endothermic? And what letters on that diagram there, A through G, designate the transition state or states and which indicate reaction intermediates? So now would be a good time to hit pause, make sure that you can answer these questions, and then we'll go through the answer for this. So getting going on the answer, first question, which step is the rate determining step? By definition, the rate determining step is the one that has the largest activation energy. So what we need to do is look at the activation energies for each of the steps of the reaction. We can tell what the steps are by looking for the peaks of the mountains along the way, along this reaction coordinate. So we start off and our activation energy for the first step is going to be the difference in energy between our starting 
energy right there and the energy required to get to that transition state, the peak of the mountain. So that's going to be what I will go ahead and call EA1 because that's our first activation energy. Then we come along, we go down the mountain a bit here to C, and then we're going to jump back up to get to D. So I'll go ahead and label that as EA2. That's our second mountain top along the way. We come on down the mountain a little bit to E here. So that's going to be a relative minima in the plot. And then we come up to the relative maxima, the peak of the mountain, as E, A, and we'll call this three because we're on to our third energy maxima. So we take a look at and compare the energies E, A, one, E, A, two, and E, A, three, those activation energies for each step. The one that has the largest activation energy is going to be the rate determining step. It looks to me like activation energy number three over there at the far right is the largest activation energy value. And so therefore we can say that step three of the reaction mechanism has to be the rate determining step because that is the step that has the highest energy requirement to overcome to get onward to the next intermediate or the product. So next question is how many steps are in the mechanism? We kind of addressed that at our discussion of rate determining step the way we can tell how many steps are in the mechanism is by how many activation energies there are. In other words, how many energy maxima are there along the curve? And we see that our curve that we've created or that we've been given here has energy maxima here, here, and here, and therefore there must be three steps in the mechanism. Onward to the next, classify the reaction as exothermic or endothermic. To do that, we compare the relative energies of our starting material. So that'd be the energy right here to the energy of our product all the way over here at G. If the energy of the product is lower than the energy of the reactant, we describe the reaction as being exothermic. On the other hand, if the energy of the product G is greater than the reactant A, we describe the reaction as being endothermic. So this one's definitely exothermic because of the fact that the energy there at the very end of the pathway is less than the energy at the beginning of the pathway. Onward, which letters designate transition states and which letters indicate reaction intermediates? So let's tackle the issue of transition states first. Remember that the transition state is that state where the bond is in the process of being made or the process of being broken and it represents the very top of the energy curve. And those three green stars that we've drawn would denote our three transition states. So our transition states are B, D, and F of the curve. Those have to be the energy maxima. Then our next question, which indicate reaction intermediates. Reaction intermediates are the troughs along the way, our relative energy minima, in other words, the bottom points of the mountain, as we go from beginning to end. But be careful here, because we are asking for intermediates, not for starting materials or final products. The starting material is gonna be whatever's at the far left, so the starting material would be A, Final product is whatever is at the far right, so that's G. Our intermediates are what come in between as the energy troughs. And so what comes in between as the energy troughs is going to be C and E, our energy troughs in route there. So we'll go ahead and write in C and E as our reaction intermediates. If we were asked to identify the reactants and the products, we would describe the reactant as A and the product as G here. So that goes ahead and concludes our discussion of reaction coordinates, which is a concept that we will be applying toward a variety of different reactions later on as we talk about reaction types and try to identify what is the bottleneck step of a reaction and what can we do with that reaction to maybe optimize how well we are able to get that reaction to run by understanding these basic features of reaction coordinates.